Bom dia a todos e todas. Que Good morning, assistem. everyone who has been with us during this webinar today. This webinar is about the Asian experiences in the struggle against the pandemic of COVID-19, and we're going to see the challenges and actions in the response of China and South Korea for the pandemic. This webinar is one of a series of events organized by the COVID-19 Observatory from the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. We're going to Professor Ju Wan Oh, Professor of the National University of Seoul, Andre Lobato, a doctor's, uh, doctorship candidate and researcher of the Center of Foreign Relations and Health from the Found Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, and Professor Adeline Mendes, who's also a professor at the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. Now, I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Cristiane Vieira Machado, the Vice President of Education, Information, and Communication of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, to give her welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Before I say anything else, I would like to thank our guests who accepted uh, to participate in this event with us. Dr. Ju Wan Oh, Professor of Policies in Health from the Medical School and the Hospital from the University of Seoul in South Korea. Professor Andre Lobat, our colleague from the Center of Foreign Relations and Health of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation and a doctorship candidate of the Technological Center of Fiocruz, and my colleague, Professor Adeline Menges, who is going to be the debater. We will have the opportunity, as Luana said, to get to know better the experiences from China and South Korea and the struggle against the pandemic of COVID-19. This webinar is part of a series of webinars that we are carrying out during a comprehensive research about policies and systems of health during the pandemic of COVID-19. It is a research that encompasses nine different countries. We have chosen some countries that have had a significant response with uh, very different profiles among them so that we could understand the possibilities and the positive aspects of the difficulties in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. China and South Korea are very interesting experiences. China is the first country that we heard that was hit by the contamination of the disease. That's where the first cases were identified and diagnosed but they had a response that nowadays is considered successful in terms of containment of the disease in that first moment. South Korea also had a response that was considered very efficient in terms of surveillance, epidemiological surveillance, which is one of the aspects that we are investigating in our research, the health surveillance measure and the health attention measures and the control for the control of the pandemic. In the case of Europe, we are including Spain and United Kingdom. We already had a webinar about Germany and Spain and another webinar that approached the United Kingdom and Canada's responses. In Latin America, we are observing the cases of Argentina, Mexico and Brazil. All of those webinars are available online, as well as this one that is going to be recorded and will be made available for those who would like to watch afterwards. If you want to share with your students the very important responses. We are in a very severe moment of the pandemic. Countries are going through what is being identified as a second wave of the pandemic. There are, of course, some controversies on that. In the case of Latin America, we have high levels of deaths 
it is very hard to talk about second year because we were having some recent trends of decreases in cases, but we have an increase again in the number of cases. So we have to discuss those aspects. And in the case of Latin America, another issue that concerns us a lot is how the pandemic exacerbates inequalities in health, which are very remarkable already in our region. So these are our important issues that we could discuss, reflect upon deeply when we look at the differences among the main countries and the aspects that were positive and successful, successful and the common challenges. The responses are national, of course, but the pandemic is a multidimensional crisis and the responses are better when they are integrated and articulated. Thank you very much for you, your availability to be here. I would like to thank our sign language interpreters and our English Portuguese interpreters who are here with us today. It is important to say that the ability of asking questions, so you can ask your questions on the comments. And after the speeches of our guests, we are going to gather some questions from YouTube to pass on to the guests for them to answer. Thank you very much and have a great event. I'll pass the floor again to Luana so she can introduce the speakers. Thank you very much. I'll pass the floor now to Professor Ju Wang O oh, that is with us very kindly today with 12 hours of difference. So it's nighttime already in Korea. So I'm going to introduce him in English. Is the professor of international policy, health policy and management at Seoul National University College of Medicine and uh, Hospital. He has a master's degree and PhD in public health and teaches global health and evaluation in public and global health for medical students at the Seoul National University. He was a Takemi Fellow uh, in International Health and currently visiting scientists on their research lead grant support uh, for SN uh, Seoul National University Hospital at Harvard T.H. Chen School of Public Health. His research interests include high quality health systems, priority setting in health, impact evaluation in global and public health, maternal and child health, uh, and universal health coverage. He served as chair of diseases specific priority setting committee, chair of national committee for catastrophic medical payment prevention, uh, current co-chair of participatory priority setting committee for health insurance benefit uh, coverage of health technology and national committee member of Korean government at ODA evaluation committee at prime minister's office and poverty eradication funds at the Ministry, Minister of Foreign Affairs for Korea government. He has served as external advisor for Korean bilateral agencies. And regarding COVID-19, he published two articles, National Response for COVID in South Korea through the Health Systems and Reform magazine and uh, Lessons Learned from Easing COVID-19 Restriction and Analysis of Countries and Regions in Asia Pacific and Europe uh, at the Lancet and one preprint article uh, on how well the societal mobility restriction helped control the COVID-19 pandemic, evidence from real-time evaluation. So now uh, I will pass the floor to Professor O oh to share with us the experience of South Korea. First of all, thank you so much for having me today uh, the, in this uh, the Brazilian uh, Consortium and and the Pio Christ, uh, the nice symposium. So it is my great honor to present South Korean responses to you. So let me start with my uh, slide. Then can you can you see my slide well? Yes. Yes, I can see okay. it. I will. Yeah, I will go now. 
uh, South Korean response uh, is uh, like this. The epidemiologic curve uh, will show the current situation. The first attack of COVID-19 was uh, in the early uh, the, the, this year, is uh, February, last week of February, until the first week of March. It was first, the first peak. Uh, the in terms of population impact is a uh, 12 per 1 million population was uh, attacked by this COVID-19 infection at that time as an outbreak. Then uh, it was uh, translated into death at, after uh, some week. Then we contained that transmission very well until uh, mid of March. So that after that, uh, this curve was decreased. So we have that containment until early uh, August. So it was almost a half year success. Then uh, in the mid of uh, August, we have some small surge there. Then uh, after that, recently we have another surging uh, now currently. So that it the uh, second surge was translated into a little more death than before then third surge might be translated into a uh, little more deaths, un unfortunately. But uh, if we go to a comparative perspective, this size of the transmission was so low, which is very similar to New Zealand and China, as uh, Vice President uh, Dr. Prisani mentioned, uh, compared to other countries such as United States and Sweden, and also your country, Brazil, and the United Kingdom, which is quite close to each other in terms of uh, case uh, transmission now. Then in terms of deaths, the all uh, United Kingdom, United States, and Sweden show the highest mortality there, while South Korea, China, New Zealand has the very lowest uh, mortality. So compared to that, uh, Brazil is in, in the middle. So, even our third surge is unfortunately coming uh, to Korea this time. Still, it is much better than other countries in the world perspective. So uh, if we see that uh, in some sense with a comparative perspective with New Zealand and China, which is a higher performing uh, the, the situation at the moment, the South Korea has a little more uh, transmission now while early phase showed a very good uh, transmission uh, rate, below transmission rate, with, which is equivalent to New Zealand. Uh, after uh, some point, August 8th, then our South Korean uh, transmission was higher than New Zealand. Also death rate is a little higher than New Zealand at the moment. So uh, let me define as first green box, the until first uh, six months, then uh, maybe I can say successful period, while uh, I can say challenging period for the rest of the uh, year from the uh, August to the current status. So let me uh, introduce the uh, circuit of success from this period and also challenging nature in that period. Let's go to the successful response period for, uh, for the first time. Then uh, let me divide into five phases in, in much in details. So zero phase, first phase, uh, and also second surging phase, third decreasing phase, fourth, uh, the plot phase, the fifth phase is decreasing phases. This is a successful period. So one of the great successful uh, responses is based on structural uh, legacy, which is universally uh, covered health services, uh, even before COVID-19. Uh, South Korean uh, population was uh, covered by national health insurance as a 100%, so no one uh, left behind uh, in terms of universal health coverage. Then normally uh, the society, national health insurance covered 80% uh, uh, of the service uh, fees. Then uh, amongst that, uh, uh, some services is covered 100% by the government, by the national health insurance. The rest of the uh, cost, zero to 
uh, should be paid by uh, patient people who are uh, using their services. So we call copayment. This zero to twenty copayment percent copayment is normal uh, in the uh, ordinary time, but for the COVID nineteen uh, diagnosis and treatment, for uh, copayment was doubly covered by tax basis of financing again, so that uh, national health insurance covers eighty percent and then twenty percent is covered by the tax, so that over one hundred percent is covered by the society. So no one, no individual person need to pay uh, during the COVID treatment and diagnosis. Uh, let me uh, briefly uh, introduce the transfer of lesson as a secret of success in terms of political aspect first, and then uh, let me introduce a technical aspect next. From the political aspect, uh, I may say uh, two things. One is good readership. And then the other one is uh, their transparent risk communications. So that uh, leadership perspective, uh, very early phases, we established uh, the high level leadership in terms of disaster management team in terms of national level. Uh, then also that was done, uh, that was maintained by the very patient persuasive uh, ways, persuasive ways. And also risk communication was done by very transparently, and then public engagement was so high. So by these two, uh, we built up very strong trust between citizens and government. By this way, uh, so, so society of Korea didn't ask any stay at home order, so lockdown order, we didn't utilize that during the early phases. And also, health professionals voluntary sacrifice for treating, treating the uh, patient, COVID patient, was so proactive and very much uh, impressive. Let me go more in details. Yeah. Phase one, uh, when there were no cases there during the uh, early phases, so January of this year, early digested uh, management team was established read by prime minister. Then also all the recognition of the that China epidemic was done during these phases. So zero phases, so much uh, the uh, active preparedness phases. Then phase one, this phase is no cases still, but uh, we rapidly established the widespread of diagnostic capacity. Uh, initially, we invented diagnostic uh, the testing capacity so it's called now RT-PCR, real-time PCR. We invented that during the last week of uh, the January after having a genetic code from the China. Then uh, scaling up of the diagnostic capacity across the whole nation was uh, going on from that time. So that during the surging time, second phase, we have uh, a lot of uh, widespread uh, diagnostic tests to Benu in the uh, uh, all Korean societies. By this way, uh, test capacity, which was utilized not only for test uh, diagnosis, but also for uh, active aggressive contact tracing uh, can be done. So that if we compare uh, how much we are actively prepared with the United States, then you can see this uh, graph. From the uh, first days of the 100 case days, then over time, uh, our gradual, uh, the testing was going on like this, while United States has very low, uh, and then also increasing was so much uh, uh, slow. And after one, one, month and half, uh, one and a half months later, it becomes similar to each other in terms of test per uh, populations. But still, if you can see the uh, negative cases and positive cases ratio, U.S. shows the highest, higher uh, negative uh, versus positive ratio. So that it means uh, we are actively uh, tested for any suspicious cases, which is some symptomatic or uh, someone contacted from the patient. So the both group are actively tested. So that's why we have a very high level, high proportion of negative rate. So that this is uh, this can be possible 
based on uh, early preparation of the test capacity scaling up. So that was a uh, politically uh, possible uh, aspect. Then technically, uh, I may be able to say two aspect. One is uh, effective quarantine, which is one of the great assets of the public health. And one, the other is isolated treatment that was done by the medical uh, facilities. Uh, but this quarantine and isolation uh, is not typical for every infectious disease. Uh, this transmission mode, much more uh, asymptomatic uh, period transmission is uh, quite high. Maybe the uh, two or three days prior to symptomatic onset, still it is uh, it shows high infectivity, and also does it does not necessarily uh, uh, contacted only by droplet. It is also contaminated by the aerosol. Uh, by based on uh, current knowledge. So that based on those two, uh, much more uh, widespread than the only for the droplet based uh, transmission and also asymptomatic transmission. Those two uh, brought uh, our society to be much more uh, active in the contact tracing and then contact tracing based quarantine with some active testing. So uh, once we are, only seeing the patient uh, the, and also symptomatic period only with their infectivity, probably we can isolate them. Then maybe that's it. Then isolation of the patient might be enough to uh, wall off the segregate the infectivity because no symptom means no infectivity. However, uh, still no symptom uh, patient has infectivity so that two or three days prior to symptom, uh, how do we uh, detect it? So there is no way. So only a way to do much more uh, actively was only for the contact tracing of the patient. So that uh, tracing reversely to check the uh, any contacted person in advance who are asymptomatic yet or not even not infected but or we can check up the risk and then we can segregate them as a quarantine so that uh, by that way, if that quarantine is perfect, then no one can be uh, transmitted from the one patient. Uh, so that this quarantine is uh, so much important in this uh, way. Then isolation is much more typical. However, still isolation was one of the innovative way Normally uh, in respiratory symptom uh, patient or many society doesn't uh, have give admission for the uh, mild cases. How only uh, the recommend admission to a hospital for the severely ill patient. But in this case, uh, isolation of the mild cases was invented in Korea, which is similar to uh, China and Taiwan then Especially, uh, we follow the China way. The, we invented a transient quasi hospital, which is not hostile at the moment. However, uh, it was originally a dormitory for the some uh, refreshment training center, doors, et cetera, or something like a hotel. However, we renovated or we repurposed that hotel into uh, observation center. We call officially a living treatment center. So that all uh, uh, test positive cases was admitted to the uh, transient quasi hospital to be monitored by health professionals. That was a very big invention while UK and uh, other Western European country didn't uh, make admission for these cases uh, as they did in the past. The, this mild cases of respiratory symptom was stayed at home but uh, probably the person who has stayed at home does not necessarily really stay at home. They can contact a neighborhood so that, that made uh, a lot of huge uh, community transmission probably. But in Korea, we didn't do it. So all cases uh, was, uh, if once diagnosed, it was isolated. So for doing that, we uh, invented a living uh, treatment center, which was up to uh, 38 uh, facilities at the maximal peak. Then uh, another uh, the invention might be this one. 
redesigning of the, uh, the treatment facilities for within and between. So that for the hostels, uh, we segregate the divided into two groups. One hostel groups as a COVID only hostel groups, when the other hostel is non COVID only hostel groups. That even for the highest hostels, such as the teaching hostel, if we cannot divide into only one group, then uh, act the, the, the perfect segregation within hostel for COVID or non COVID was done. So that uh, that is one way for the critically ill patient. For the mild cases, as I mentioned to you, uh, just before transient cross-site hospital was utilized, that was not true hospital. There was a hotel, but it, it was repurposed uh, the center now. Then triage between uh, uh, which track uh, was should be utilized. That triage uh, was done at the entry point of each hospital or uh, uh, every single district triage center. So any respiratory symptom patient uh, or fever patient uh, shouldn't go directly to the hospital. They need to visit triage center first. Then we'll equip the triage center uh, personnel uh, diagnosed by the test first. After having test within a day, then they can be assigned to a hospital or non-COVID hospital, so or et cetera, et cetera. Then also uh, redesigning of the prevention system by local contact tracing, by scaling up of district level uh, quasi the epidemiology intelligence service members who are not previously epidemiological intelligence service members, but it was scaled up by a short term training or uh, task shifting. So the every district has contact tracing members. So by designing, uh, uh, distinguishing COVID flow and the non COVID flow, as you may see the hostel, has two sections, COVID section and non-COVID section in the same hostel. Then the other hostel also same. Then some smaller hostel may have only uh, uh, this, this uh, designated as a only COVID hostel or non-COVID hostels. So they can see only the uh, uh, treat uh, non-COVID or COVID only during this period. An observation center for many and an ambulatory clinic for non-COVID those are uh, uh, and, and, uh, admitted, the, those are visited only by uh, triage center distinguishment. So by this way, uh, any nosocomial infection uh, can be possible theoretically, then real uh, nosocomial infection was very low as well. So uh, hospital personnel, health professionals infection rate is uh, one of the lowest in the world by this system. And prevention system redesigning, uh, as I mentioned, local tracers were scaled up by temporary way, uh, not only a central or provincial level EIS officers working, temporarily uh, district level officers working so much that was the secret of the uh, community uh, contact tracing and also quarantine based on these members. And another uh, important aspect might be uh, community quarantine. 14 days of quarantine at home is totally paid so that everyone is paid by government uh, through employer or directly so that this tax money based uh, uh, paid leave uh, might be one of the, uh, the incentive not to uh, go out during the quarantine period. So perfect quarantine can be theoretically possible by this way. So this is quite different from other countries which are uh, not supporting by paid leave, then uh, people may want to get uh, earning money uh, to feed their family members so that uh, that made the transmission possibility uh, during the uh, quarantine period. That might be one of the difference between South Korea and other countries. During the contact tracing, uh, we utilize the interview the once patient was diagnosed, uh, then patient make a recall for their contact in the past two days. Then based on that uh, recall, and then additionally, we investigate uh, uh, phone location by GPS mobile, and also card, uh, credit card transaction uh, log, and CCTV. All those are uh, complementary uh, information based is, uh, was utilized and also investigate the medical record for any recent visit to a clinic or hospital for uh, 
uh, treating the uh, undiagnosed symptom of respiration. So by this way, uh, we defined uh, the, uh, the contact by the duration more than 10 to 15 minutes, we define the close contact and also less than uh, 15 minutes uh, and also very light contact was defined as casual contact. Then only close contact was monitored and then uh, segregation, the quarantine was applied 14 days. Then every uh, day, uh, twice uh, calling for any symptom uh, onset or et cetera is monitored by a uh, remote way by the phone call and also uh, the self-recording uh, uh, application of the web, uh, phone, smartphone as well. More detailed contact tracing and then uh, the testing, uh, the, especially for the contact tracing was uh, published by this paper, this journal, also public health risk, uh, respective, uh, perspective, response perspective. This journal is, uh, is public, published by uh, the Korean CDC, now Korean Dis uh, Disease Control Agency. So if I review the uh, uh, cases, one when someone is diagnosed as COVID-19, uh, she or he is recalling his contact or her contact to give a prevention mode for the, any contacted person. That contacted person was quarantined after testing. If testing was negative, uh, 14 days, uh, and then uh, released. And then if testing uh, at, the, at the end of uh, 14 days, uh, then if that is uh, someday, if the result is positive, then they are uh, treated as a patient. Then also uh, when someone is diagnosed, if he or she is treated as isolation centers. So if, even though uh, she or he has very mild symptoms, still admitted to uh, the quasi-transient hospitals, if he's uh, the severely ill, definitely uh, admitted to hospitals and then treated. So this way, uh, treatment uh, totally isolated, then contact totally isolated by quarantines. So when someone diagnosed, infectivity was isolated both way in the hospital and the community together. Theoretically, it then made 100% uh, of the all cases. If uh, it is going on quite well. By this way, uh, our four months of the attack, uh, accumulated attack in the left side, uh, every, almost every district has their, uh, uh, the cases. However, at the, in the middle of the April, there is almost no cases in the many uh, districts. So by this way, we can say uh, we are very successful during the early phases uh, of the pandemic. All detailed information about the national response to COVID-19 of South Korea was published by uh, this paper, Health Systems and Reforms, as Luana uh, mentioned in the beginning of this session. So uh, let me go to uh, last one third uh, of time of my presentation for, the, uh, for sharing of the challenges, especially during the late phases of pandemic now. So, the politically, uh, the leadership uh, was not continuing the same uh, style of leadership. Previously, it is very uh, the persuasive, very soft. But uh, after some time, especially after general election winning, then uh, ruling party uh, become much more regulative, much more paternalistic, a uh, little bit coercive. So that some of the governors and uh, the provincial governors uh, applied lockdown, which was done only in the Western countries and then uh, US, uh, which was not done in the uh, past in the South Korea. But uh, this is one different ways uh, compared to previous early phases. And also some social blaming of disarming of the victims, the, the cases or cluster of cases if a patient was appearing in one uh, small business centers or bars or any restaurants or any small business uh, stores, then that the place was uh, socially blamed. Uh, so this blaming the victim might be the new invention uh, which was imported from the uh, Western countries 
uh, this was not utilized in Korea in the early basis, but later on it was quite uh, popular. So that was uh, one of the change in nature in the leadership, uh, not all leadership, but some provincial level leaderships. And also risk of communication, uh, mainly by the uh, Korean CDC that was utilized quite uh, stably and then consistently, no change. But this only political leadership change made very uh, different atmosphere. The public trust was lower than before, and also conflict between uh, health professionals and government, uh, in this case, uh, with the central government by some uh, another threes. There were a uh, big uh, conflict between health professionals and government. So this uh, uh, lowered trust between uh, lay public and government and lowered trust between health professional and government became one of the uh, change in nature in terms of political aspect. And technical aspect, probably isolation uh, might be going on quite well, while uh, quarantine might have some slippery nature in some sense. Uh, this red uh, description is my conjecture and my hypothesis at the moment. The, we uh, contact here, we, we trace the only first layer of contact and then quarantine those group only, uh, while these first layers of contact may contact another layers as a second layer at the same time, at the same day. So the infectivity might be transferred already to the second layers but we only uh, apply quarantine for the first layer. And also uh, from the, uh, the time perspective, we apply only two day advance from the diagnosis or symptom onset phase. However, uh, if that uh, sim the infectivity is onset is already beginning uh, before symptom two or three days prior to the symptom onset, Maybe two days before diagnosis, so symptom onset might be a little late. Maybe some persons, uh, we don't know the exact amount. However, some proportion of the patient would be uh, escaped, uh, excluded by this way, so that we may need to uh, extend the three days or four days before the diagnosis to uh, apply the duration. And also we may consider a second layer of contact uh, for quarantine possibilities. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, they listed up the four layer uh, contact in advance, although they apply quarantine only for the first layer, but they already uh, uh, have list of the second layer and third layer and fourth layer even. So that once uh, someone is uh, diagnosed from the first layer, second layer becomes uh, first layer directly, the quickly, then they are quarantined so quickly. Uh, but with South Korea didn't have this system so that we may uh, need this more active second layer and third layer uh, contact list suggestion. So this might be uh, one of my uh, uh, conjecture or idea uh, to be investigating uh, perfectness of contact tracing at the moment. If contact tracing is perfect enough, then uh, Third surge might be not possible because all infectivity might be isolated uh, once or uh, when a person is diagnosed. But uh, in inevitably, uh, someone may be a leak, then the leaked patient might be the infection sources. But if that infection source is not just for a randomly leak, it's a much more systematically leaked by this way then we may uh, embrace much more days or much more layers than before. But we, we knew now, especially for after having five or seven days later, even symptom is still there, then infectivity is not there. So that is one of the uh, great uh, knowledge uh, at the moment uh, based on South Korean evaluation, the internal evaluation of cases. So, cut down the, uh, the rest of the quarantine or isolation period, but uh, the increasing the early phases before the symptom that might be uh, uh, maybe change in the, in the future. Then uh, lastly, maybe I can say this is really cha challenging. It, this, is, uh, this should be done uh, triangulated by other researchers, but my research shows that uh, behavioral measures might be not truly helpful at the moment once 
isolation and quarantine was going on very well. While if isolation and quarantine is not going on very well, behavioral measure might be uh, helpful. But once that public health measure such as isolation and then uh, the, uh, the quarantine is going on well, then maybe behavioral uh, change might be supplementarily helpful, but not truly really main measures uh, to be stressed so that society need to focus much more on uh, isolation or uh, quarantine uh, rather than focusing too much on the uh, individual's public uh, public liability behavioral measures. For example, in South Korea, after controlling the pandemic, the epidemic outbreak very well, suddenly South Korean government uh, stressed uh, the strong recommendation for minimizing non-essential mobility, so-called social distancing from the uh, April. Then uh, it, it was not utilized in Korea, only people uh, voluntarily already reduced their uh, mobility toward lower, lower period, lower level. But after having controlling, then suddenly society uh, strongly recommended mobility restriction, but people doesn't uh, follow that uh, recommendation. Although people voluntarily reduce their mobility without uh, society's uh, high level of recommendation. So uh, this might be one of the interesting example. People are very uh, active to make their uh, responses, not only by course the recommendation or, or regulation, by understanding of their own way, they can voluntarily uh, adhere to public health protocols. So by this way, uh, we can see the high level of epidemic outbreak. During that time, people voluntarily reduced their mobility while society didn't mention, uh, didn't regulate it. But once the society began to regulate the mobility, but mobility is not responded, actually increased, but there is no more transmission there. This was done uh, also for the high uh, population centers, such as Gangnam. Uh, you may know the Gangnam style in, in the past. That's the uh, financial center in Seoul. Then during that period, the epidemic period, the mobility was reduced in about 15%. That's not huge, but uh, it was voluntarily reduced during this March uh, this year. And also one the other epicenter in Daegu, uh, which is the first epicenter, it is reduced about one third of the uh, mobility that was voluntarily reduced. But this is enough to get the uh, lower transmission rate without any lockdown order. So United States showed the uh, uh, mobility reduction and then that is translated into COVID-19 incidence rate. This is my research. And, but this is only basis result. United Kingdom also showed the similar way the reducing the mobility, uh, then incidence rated to COVID-19 was achieved, the, the reduced during the early phases. However, in the late phases, uh, this mobility uh, change was not translated into a lower incidence rate in United States and the United Kingdom. Very slight uh, compared to early phases. It means Mobility restriction itself, efficacy of that is uh, wane, or it is not main mechanism of the reducing uh, the transmission rate. Probably public health measure, such as the isolation and quarantine activity is much more powerful than uh, people's mobility reducing. South Korea showed a similar way, but much more uh, interesting. All the phases, a uh, very small range of mobility restriction was achieved uh, and also it was translated into incidence rate uh, decreasing. However, in late phases, uh, as I mentioned, the challenging phases, lower transmission, uh, lower mobility is translated into higher in fact in incidence rate, not the lower the incidence rate. So that it means even people are lowering the mobility, uh, still uh, transmission rate can be goes up, can be going up because of the uh, other uh, reasons. So, Mobility itself might be uh, not the reason uh, in, in, in transmission mode perspective. This was uh, published in the preprint version in, in this paper. 
the reason might be explained by this way. The mechanism of the transmission is uh, now we call 3C, close contact and then close space staying uh, with the longer station and also crowded uh, the spaces. So this 3C three, three is not directly uh, reduced by the only mobility restriction. So even people are mobile, the, the mobile sufficiently, still they can make a, a reduced close contact and then uh, this 3C can be reduced by their meticulous uh, activities, uh, adherence uh, to the public health protocol. However, if they don't really uh, concern about this 3C, although they reduce their mobility, then probably their contact and their uh, staying at the closed space and they, their staying at the crowded uh, population can be done with, with a reduced mobility so that lockdown order, stay at home order, but by uh, coercive ways of the restricting mobility might be not translated well into this reducing of the three Cs. So by this uh, mechanism perspective, uh, I might be saying, uh, Rather than coercive lockdown order, please uh, make persuasive uh, leadership style. Uh, then people may understand and people may follow that uh, public health protocol very well. Then although they can move around, still they can keep a uh, very much reduced contact, reduced close, close space staying, reduced crowdedness so that by that way, uh, people can use more new normal life with a reduced transmission. So that's my uh, conjecture. Not strong evidence yet. However, this interpretation of my result, uh, reduced mobility is not translated into trans, uh, lower transmission in the later phases of pandemic might be explained by this uh, people's adherence to the public health protocol to be sensitive to the transmission mode rather than blunt uh, mobility restriction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Oh. Uh, thank you for sharing with us this uh, important experience uh, of the South Korean country. Um, we, we can see that even having very different countries and different systems, we, we can have uh, transferable lessons uh, from, from your country to ours as well. It was important to see the effects of the leadership <coughs> changes, um, which we've just passed through elections here in Brazil. So uh, we might start to see that in the next month. And uh, well, it, I will speak Portuguese now, sorry. Eu vou passar logo a palavra para o André Lobato. I will Lobato. give the floor to André Lobato who is going to present the chapter that he wrote for the diplomacy book on COVID-19 developed by the International Center for Health Organization in Etfio Cruz that includes several different responses from different countries in many different regions of the world during the pandemic. And Andrea is going to speak about China. Andrea very kindly decided to speak in English because Professor O was speaking in a, in a language that is not his native language, so he's going to present in English. A PhD candidate in the program of strategies and development of the Institute of Economics in Rio de Janeiro Federal University studying the development of biotechnology in China. He's a researcher at the Global Health Center of Fiocruz and since 2017, he supports Fiocruz cooperation with Chinese science and technology institutions. He has a master's degree in global media and communications from Fudan, Shanghai, and the London School of Economics. And he uh, has also worked in the South American Institute of Government in Health. Andre, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Luana, uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with President uh, Cristiani here. Also, I would like to say that the uh, presentation of Professor Zhu Wong was really good. Uh, I already wanted to make some questions, but before, uh, let me introduce you the presentation I've made recently 
about uh, my chapter uh, on the book, on Kyoku's book. It's a kind of like an instant book. So the idea is to capture uh, the first six months of the year, the first six months of pandemic. And I start with this image of a fashion uh, show that happened in Beijing some months ago in October, where people uh, are already not wearing masks, so they don't need to wear masks anymore. Uh, and they decided to use this image of a woman uh, wearing uh, a mirror as a mask. And so I, I think this kind of brings us a little bit of discussion about why it's so difficult to use masks here in Brazil and why in other countries it's, it's more easy, people use it more frequently. And there is also a kind of sense of respect for the other maybe. And so this is an introductory image. So the book was written over a period of, si of six months. And I have analyzed both uh, Chinese and Western media uh, using three dimensions. The first one was diplomatic because we are from the International Center of Kyoku, so we are more connected with WHO and, <clears throat> and international organizations. A sanitary one uh, that is dedicated to more the technological part and a socioeconomic one that is more focused on the developments of, for example, credits to support the pandemic or even other things that happen in the country while the pandemic is happening in the world, such as uh, space exploration, for example. So <clears throat> the context when this all begins, because last year we, that we did not know that you would have a, a pandemic, but some things were already happening in China. And first of them, uh, in the international uh, arena, there was the pivot to Pacifico uh, from the United States, so more pressure uh, in China. And also China, the pressure, I don't know if you can see my, my, my mouse, but the, let me put the, so you, you have, uh, so you have some uh, pressure here, uh, from United States and then the, the Chinese, they, they launched the, the Belt and Road Initiative that is more inside Asia, although it also has a maritime, uh, uh, a maritime uh, phase, I'd say. Uh, and then you have the Section 301 of the White House that is basically the trade war and also China celebrating the 70 years of the Rep Popular Republic. And this is kind of like the, the context of the moment. And historically, uh, we also could see emerging the, some reminiscences of the OP war, the Korea war, and also uh, China moving forward in terms of like a re, uh, getting young again. I, don't, I forgot this word in, in English, like a rejuvenation of the, of the nation. And in the sanitary context, we had like the swine flu that killed 200 uh, heads of pig in, in China. We already had the SARS, we had the avian flu, and also we had like a, a very strong uh, scientific improvement in Chinese society in all aspects. And this, because we, I analyze a lot of politics as well, I made this, this clear that there are some issues uh, regarding technology and market that are very present in today's economic disputes. And they resemble a little bit uh, a moment when Asia, the South of Asia, China, Professor knows this very well, Korea as well, they were very abundant societies. So, there was some competition uh, to these markets. And when does this epidemic begin? Uh, this epidemic begins in the Chinese New Year, right? Uh, all the societies planning trips everywhere in the country, also outside the country. And it happens in Wuhan. Wuhan is the core 
of the ra rapid, the high speed rail system of China, that is a really big uh, highway system. And so it was kind of like a total reverse of expectations, right? Uh, in, they had like this 3 billion uh, ish, uh, trips planned because you have rail trips, you have airplane uh, trips, you have bus trips. And in about, and from 15 of December, about 15 of December and 20 of January, they have identified the problem, analyzed uh, the action lines available and made the unified decision process. So what was the problem? A virus that has uh, a transmission rate uh, uh, that transmitted uh, through air and affected the lungs. So it was a pneumonia of known, uh, known uh, orange and the period of incubation was about uh, two weeks. And the symptoms were very similar to the symptoms of other disease, although the consequences could be much worse. And what was the decision they made? They made a decision of to stop everything and to treat everybody. And in China, in specifically, this means that they basically uh, attach it uh, a, a support health system to their existing health system, not only by not allowing uh, the contamination to other areas, but also by uh, uh, saying to the health providers that uh, be paid if they were treating uh, COVID uh, patients. So this process, after they closed it, uh, they continue to quarantine people who had left Wuhan so there was lines of uh, connection about those who had left and also a lot of support from other regions to Wuhan, meaning uh, specific cities uh, would take care of specific parts of Wuhan, guaranteeing uh, food, guaranteeing medical supplies. And this was a sanitarian uh, court, a sanitarian net around uh, Wuhan that guaranteed that everybody in quarantine uh, could be provided with everything that they need to be in quarantine. So basically you were or helping uh, in the quarantine or you were in quarantine in yourself. This varied a lot uh, in different cities, but for example, Shanghai, that's a very, very big city. It has 25 million people. Everybody did the quarantine, the streets were empty for two weeks, maybe even more, and they all used masks and they had like seven deaths, seven deaths so far in Shanghai. Recently, the most, uh, the, the not local case uh, transmitted in China was in, 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 in Shanghai. So you can see how this really was a issue at that time because they had to close all the country when everybody was planning to travel and Wuhan was a core of this uh, communication systems. Well, this had a uh, important effect uh, because when we, this is a March uh, graph. So in March, uh, you could already see uh, that the, the, the closing of uh, Wuhan really worked because ex Hubei means uh, not uh, all China except the province where Wuhan is, that is Hubei. So you see the cases going up around the world. In Hubei, uh, they, they flat, and in China, they also flat at a smaller rate. And professor was talking about risk communication. And also I saw a lot of information in public TV, in all kinds of scientists, organizations, uh, they stay in home, protect yourself. Uh, this is a Chinese uh, saying for a hundred illness will not uh, invade, will not uh, uh, take us. And so happy new year, stay with your family, stay safe. And this was 
so a kind of like national new year, new new year. You know, everybody was everybody realized that they they a new year would be different. And what were the organizations that were mainly responsible for these uh, surveillance? Because you also started to do surveillance in other areas that they had no cases at all. And the response, we have the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention alongside with the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, they isolated the virus, they uh, identified uh, how to do the test kits, and so they also provided the sequencing of the, the new coronavirus, uh, and this is, was one of the core responsibilities of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, the National Health Commission uh, had a very, very, very strong role uh, I would say that the most strong role was the Health Commission of the Public of the People's Republic, uh, and there it's very interesting to say that the tri traditional medicine had a very strong role, role in the whole process. Uh, they created uh, a kinds of specific medicines for for the disease. Uh, we know that Chinese trust the traditional medicine a lot. So it also helps to, to, to make you people believe that they can, they, they can face the, the, the disease. And also the articulation with uh, the different provinces. That's also very important because you have uh, different layers of governance uh, in health uh, in China. And the state councils of the People's Republic of China that uh, is uh, it's the legislative uh, body of, of, of China. And we had, for example, to, uh, they have to, to close hospitals, all this legislative work, all these authorizations uh, to move uh, the response accordingly to what they thought was needed. Uh, we can see the, the state uh, council, the People's Republics of China, not necessarily the, the state council itself, but if you included also the provinces and the lower levels of administration that took their own role in this epidemic fight. Also very important to note that China uh, has a, a communist party. Uh, this is Major General uh, Chen Wei. Uh, she's the response for the biodefense of China, and she took the first shot of the of the vaccine. Uh, and they also helped a lot uh, by providing food, shelter, military organization to the face of the epidemic, and thousands and millions, thousands, many thousands of uh, Chinese uh, volunteers were associated with the Chinese Communist Party. So they provided a kind of like more uh, voluntary on uh, work. And obviously uh, the Chinese society in general that could understand the risks and uh, do the quarantine. Uh, they really stayed at home, even in places where the contact uh, was really, really low. And I think we should all help that. We should all be very thankful for that, it's especially all oh, Taiwan as well, Korea as well. Every country that is helping with the virus not spreading, it's uh, helping everybody else. And despite that, I also want to mention that there were a lot of politics involving the issue of the virus, that the issue of the virus was treated many times with racism against Chinese and Asians in, in general. Uh, and this probably didn't help very much the, the response, uh, not even in China, not even elsewhere. And so I use this image of the movie Matrix where the agent Smith uh, tells that human are a virus, that we are a virus uh, in the planet. And here is an image uh, of cryo-electron tomography from the Tsinghua University that actually shows how is a virus. And <clears throat> one of the things that I am uh, worried about, it's if the news report
reports on China, on, on Asian in general, when they did need to do the quarantine. And this was portrayed a little bit as if they were the citizens had no, no action, or if it was something very evil that was being done uh, uh, with the population. And so here I, I selected some stories. The Wall Street Journal, for example, wrote that a Wuhan writer rages against China's communist machine and becomes an online star. That was basically a poet uh, in Wuhan that was writing about how unsatisfied she was with being in quarantine in Wuhan at that time. And here, like Wuhan forced into mass coronavirus quarantines, risking infections. And even though many months later, uh, this response uh, proved positive, uh, the Financial Times China COVID what, what went wrong in Wuhan. So I think that uh, this could this also creates problems for us when we tell people that we need them to stay in quarantine, that we need them to use masks and, and, and so on. And this is the, some of the very important issues that happened during the, 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 the months in, in, in China. Uh, it's important to mention some economic uh, points. The government has uh, rolled out 1.5 trillion of UNs and titles to finance vaccines, technologies, laboratories, movable laboratories, lines uh, uh, of sourcing emergency uh, uh, items. And so uh, the legislators, they, 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 they offered more subsides for uh, health co coverage plans. And the, the poor, they received more money. And the national uh, budget, uh, you see it's not very, very high, 7.2% in health, uh, in health co costs. Uh, China also started to do a lot of international help, providing, for example, through the, the sisterhood cities, uh, Sichuan and Pernambuco are two provinces in China. They have some kind of friendship and they exchanged uh, material. And also very important, like how China could provide so many million masks, for example, at uh, an instance. They, the Ministry of Security uh, and Social Security, they organized it with 10,000 companies uh, how to produce the medical equipments, how to produce masks. So who has uh, some capital, some machine, some people that can produce masks? So how many masks, how many million masks uh, we want? And they, they, fo they folded 90 times the production of masks uh, in the country in a very, very short uh, time. And although all these disputes asked East, West and so on, a major collaborations with the United States, German and United Kingdom, and a lot of international uh, policy making from Xi Jinping, presidential diplomacy from Xi Jinping. Uh, here I selected some pictures of the BRICS countries uh, gatherings the last, uh, with the last uh, three Brazilian presidents. But I know that Xi Jinping also spoke with Korea. Uh, one of the talks that uh, Korea and China had were about the production lines how they were able to so fastly create uh, hotlines so the any issue regarding the production slides could be solved without uh, creating more risk to the production lines in terms of contamination of the workers or cross-contamination between the two countries. Uh, here are some of the vaccines uh, registers in the clinic, uh, China, clan, uh, China Clinic uh, in Index Registry. And we have 15 vaccines. This is from the October uh, 18. It was the last time that I did this uh, uh, check. And why we, I put these 15 vaccines? To show that we we'll still have many options. There are many possible ways out of the pandemic. And vaccines are one of them. 
uh, there are many other forms to 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 resist uh, the vaccines. The vaccines now are going to enter in a new age where we are planning to to vaccine all the planets, and this involves uh, all questions of economics and sanitary that should be treated accordingly. So what is the use values of the, the vaccines? How they will be exchanged? Uh, if there will be a lot of profit, no profit, if it's going to be a new technology a, a more, uh, uh, a technolo or a technology that is already being in use or other countries so they can they produce their own uh, vaccines. And there are more than 300 vaccines uh, around the world. And China has produced uh, vaccines. It's already doing emergency of vaccination for some months. And these, these vaccines, they are based on the, the virus. They are not this new technology, new RNA technology. And they have been in use uh, for Chinese that go abroad uh, to countries where the, uh, the contamination rate is very high. Uh, also for people in hospitals, uh, for people in, in nurseries. Uh, so this strategy was rolled out uh, two months ago of the emergency vaccination. And here uh, I would like to, to point out uh, what the National Commission for Development in Reform has announced as ways of preventing the next pandemic. So what would they need if they had another big pandemic in China? Uh, they would need improvement in tests and the ampliation of laboratories of biosecurity. So they want to create for even every big province, every province, every uh, provincial level, a P3 laboratory. And for every like a big city, let's say this way, uh, a P2 laboratory. So they would be like a trip. 30 P3 and 300 P2 if they do this uh, accordingly. Uh, and the ampliation of treatment in hospital centers of infectious diseases, adapted, adapted or new ones. So or you create new hospitals or you check all old hospitals to see how they would react to a pandemic. Uh, and the system uh, is going to be centralized. We know China has some difficulties to centralization in many of the, its systems. Uh, because it's very, very big country. Uh, and uh, with the uh, local level classification, they would be able to send patients through uh, different provinces. So the ampliation of the basis of treatments of the core epidemics. So how to treat the core epidemics uh, with med traditional medicine or Western medicine. And they both could receive different kinds of uh, disease, especially patients in critical conditions. And the construction uh, of uh, new quarantine uh, sites uh, or the adaptation of old ones. So for example, you have a football stadium. How could you use a, a football stadium if you need to do quarantine? The flow of uh, residues, the air, the sanitary conditions around, and how could this be improved as, for example, exchange airs. And also, and finally, to make the materials more available, uh, how to better coordinate and make the security line safer. If you have a big epidemic, how you're going to move the response around without moving the pandemic as well. So they propose like uh, silos for material when you have outbreaks and these silos could be globally uh, allocated uh, and capacity of production and a multilateral system to coordinate the local allocation of supplies, emergency supplies. Uh, here, I'm in this, this, this part of the slide, I am uh, suggesting in my PhD, that we take uh, the analysis of the biotechnology industry in the in situ, in vitro, in, in e silico. That's a very common uh, way of ca categorizing it. So, in situ uh, would be the locals, the cities, 
the in vitro would be everything that is digital. Uh, for example, the genetic material, when it's digitalized, it becomes uh, in vitro. And in silico, that is the laboratory line, uh, the, microbi the microbiology of the, of the disease. And how can we analyze all these different uh, sections? We have the eternization of the governments and different uh, juridical, judicial regimes and new actors. So we see, for example, uh, in Asia, uh, that they have a different perspective, uh, for example, regard patent law uh, of genes and how uh, this is related with public health. Uh, we know that uh, vaccines are expensive to produce, but one, once they are produced, and if they are really in need, uh, they can be very expensive as any medical uh, treatment. And also we need uh, laboratory or networks where science uh, it's actually produced and can be situated, can be understood by people, scientists. And the symbolic forces that, uh, that govern the legitimacy of science in a global level. So for example, maybe if there was more sympathy between different countries, the general use of masks in Asia could be better replied, better copied here in, in, in the West, in the Western Hemisphere. And also the institutional demand to analyze all these risks. You need in the societies uh, institutions that will translate these risks to the uh, general uh, population. So this is my presentation. I am very happy to have spoken with you. And this is my thank you. And here is the picture of my, my PhD supervisor, Carlos Morel, that works uh, in Fiocruz in many different fields. One of them is the cooperation uh, with China. And I have been there with him two times and we could see many laboratories there. And it's very interesting to see how they have been developing their uh, surveillance and response capabilities. Thank you so much. Muito obrigada, André, é, por essa apresentação tão abrangente. Realmente, nas duas apresentações, a gente pode ver... Thank you very much, André, for the comprehensive presentation. In both presentations, we could see that we have challenges in the beginning of the pandemic and the future challenges that we have to deal with for the prevention of a new pandemic, which is something that we know that could happen. Now I'll pass the floor to Dr. Adeline Menges for her comments on the two cases. Dr. Adeline is a professor and researcher of the Department of Planning and Health of the National Public Health School from Fiocruz. She's a master in public health with uh, emphasis in management of systems. She's a doctor of public health with uh, part of her doctorship in Madrid. Recently, she concluded her postdoctorate degree abroad in Spain, and she works there as a visiting professor with focus on epidemiology and public health inequalities and systems of health. She has over 10 years, experience, years of experience in research in public health involving the analysis of policies and systems of compared uh, health. So please, Professor Adelini. Thank you very much, Luana. I'd like to thank Professor Juan Ho and Andre Lobato for the brilliant presentations. I'm going to speak in Portuguese. I know that Professor Chuhan Ho can listen to the translation. So I'd like to start by mentioning some aspects that motivated us to build this, this webinar on the Asian experience. South Korea and China are two countries who had a good response facing uh, COVID-19 and also epi epidemiologic 
uh, responses that were very good. So we have ep epidemiologic data and Ch China up until today, since the first case on December 21st until today, has 73,000 cases of COVID-19 and 44,000 deaths. And South Korea, only for 545 deaths. And absolute numbers and accumulated numbers, the South Korea is among the, the last cases in the Asian context. When we analyze the accumulated cases per million inhabitants in China is the lowest 64 per million in Korea, 732 cases. Comparing with European uh, data and global data, these are excellent results. The number of deaths per million in China is 3.3 and in Korea 10.63. Just for us to have a comparative parameter in Brazil, the death, accumulated death per million in December 5 was 830.96 deaths. So we identify here with this data related to the number of cases and deaths, a response that is very effective from the standpoint of action and government work. Although we had a moderate growing of cases in the last 15 days, as Professor Cho Han Ho has commented, the lethality is very low, 5.2%. 4% in China and 1.5 in South Korea. And another aspect that is highlighted in both cases is the high capacity of testing, especially the RT-CPR and the extensive utilization of new technology in the digital health field. We know that China and South Korea are two countries with uh, a lot of population. China is the with more than 1 billion inhabitants and South Korea with more than 50 million. In China, the population of that is over uh, 65 is 11 percent in South Korea, around 15 percent. So they have this age pyramid that is less uh, old compared to with European countries. And they also share cultural aspects and historic aspects. But there are differences. In South Korea, the urbanization was growing. Today, they have 81 percent of the population living in the urban area with a lot of sanitation and drinkable water, internet services and technology. Uh, China and 61% in urban pop, uh, population, sanitary systems of 75%. And they, there's a, a great part of the population living um, in poverty. Although they had excellent results for diminishing poverty, the inequalities are present in both cases in, as in the rest of the world. The Gini index is 38.5 and in South Korea is 31.6. Concerning socioeconomic aspects, what I would like to mention in this debate, it's very important to highlight that they are two countries with a high level of uh, economic development. China is one of the great economic powers in the world and South Korea is the main Asian tiger. Both countries have a productive structure that is very sound with levels of unemployment in 2019 considered low 4.4 in China and 4.6% in South Korea, and a very important participation of the industry and in the GDP of the country, around 30%. So there's an industrial activity that is very productive in both countries that can be associated with the capacity of, of response in, in both countries. In terms of uh, health expenses, they, ex, uh, they spent 5.1 and 7.6% of the GDP respectively. 
they could be considered lower consider compared to OECD, but an important key here for understanding the good response from the, stand, the sanitation san standpoint is the ability of leadership and the fact that these governments have take, have recognized that the, the, the treatment should be free for all with norms that would enable the users of health centers could be serviced uh, outside of the residence centers. So it's very probable that this social and demographic and economic uh, characteristics are conditioning for the answers of these countries during the pandemic. So it's very interesting to understand how coming from this context, these countries are organizing their responses and are able to deal effectively and well, producing, producing good results in terms of the control of the dissemination of the pandemic. I've been analyzing the role of governance and the national coordination to the institutionality of the government response to COVID-19. It's a topic that I've worked with in this technical note of the observatory of COVID-19 in Fiocruz, and I've been enhancing that and improving that in this, this research that was commented by Luana and Cristiane Machado. So I'd like to propose to this debate one of this, the core arguments that I've been working with, that the institutionality of the government response to this pandemic is associated to the state capacity of formulating, planning, and implementing sanitary policies and also social and economic policies to face COVID-19. In this sense, I've been analyzing that this institutionality of the government response from five dimensions. That is the actions and strategies developed to, to curb the, the dissemination of the pandemic that was mentioned in South Korea and in China, in, encompassing the isolation of cases, quarantine of contacts and other measures to restrict mobility until the community confining that would be the highest uh, measure in the scale from the study of the epidemiologic and capacity of the health system. Another dimension that is strengthening the, the, the health system, understanding that is key to enhance the capacity of assistance and surveillance in, in public health to promote better results and the offer of social and economic measures to protect the population, especially the more vulnerable population, the worker and the, the, the productive textile, considering the companies and the economic activities that could be affected by the confining measures. Another in dimension that is very important is the communication with society. And I'd like to agree with Professor Chuhan Ho that these strategies, they are key so that the, the control measures to, to, to curb the dissemination of the disease uh, in the society is part of this process and they have the right of having information about the Senate sanitary system we have this effective and transparent communication so that we can have the engaging of the, pop the population and another uh, dimension and the last one that is not the, the least important and is cross is crossing the others is the structure of governments and national coordination and the features of this this uh, governance and coordination in the sense of who is taking over the leadership of this process and also how the, the government's structures are organized since the, the central level until the provinces and local uh, administration. The location of intelligence and analysis and also the decentralization and decentralization of the measures and actions with the services and places that are in the front line identifying the new cases and the new deaths in the pandemic. So 
the case analysis of China and South Korea sh shows that both countries have a high political ability for coordinating a national response and also a high fiscal and financial capacity. These are important conditions that could have favored the government response in both cases. China and South Korea, they have these favorable con conditionings and they could be different aspects that could have compensated other previous characteristics that were unfavorable. So from the analysis of some cases, some European cases, especially German, uh, Germany, Spain, and China, and, and China and South Korea, I'm going to propose some reflections and lessons learned, and I'd like to share with you and bring to this debate. Our first issue is that facing this crisis generated by COVID, COVID that require strategies and articulated actions in several uh, public health uh, aspects, social, economic, sanitary issues, actions, and they are very highlighted in China and South Korea. Professor Chu Han Ho brought in his presentation that South Korea recognized early this problem and was prepared with the protocol of the response before the first case. They increased the testing capacity as soon as they received uh, the code from China, and they had this mass strategy to, to curb the dissemination. South Korea used hotels for mild cases, a strategy that China also used, using the isolation of cases and quarantine of contacts. And South Korea also used very well its ability of testing to promote this quarantine of, of close contacts. We know that that when people are aware that they are really infected, they are able to, to be in quarantine in, in a more responsible way. And I agree with Chu Han Ho, Professor Chu Han Ho, that the challenge is how to communicate the importance of the quarantine for the population before the, the beginning of the symptoms so that we have more effective quarantines. Another aspect that is very important could be taken, considered a lesson, a lesson learned in some global cases is the construction of a national plan for facing the pandemic and its effects. That is agreed among different levels of government and its sanitary authorities. It, that could favor the curbing the epidemic and reducing the inequality in the distribution of resources. It's important to highlight the coordination in two areas, the health assistance and treatment, and also the surveillance in, in public health. In the assistance, it's important to have the definition of flows and protocols for assistance and to detect and uh, treat and follow up uh, confirmed cases in the health services either primary or, or hospital services, and in the public health levels to identify uh, probable and confirmed cases and also the flow for lab confirmation and register for mortality and infections. These are key aspects so that the country can conduct the actions to analyze the the diagnosis and uh, conduct the actions and, and evaluate the actions, the ongoing actions. We know that knowing the territory and the use of uh, active surveillance can favor favorite results, favor favorable results, and other aspects that are very important in China and South Korea. The third aspect that could be a lesson learned is understanding the seriousness of crisis by the government and establishing this government's and national co coordination in the strategies of for COVID for an effective response. This government could involve the articulation in, in between different levels of government, public service. It is. We include the articulation with the organizations of workers and we involve the legislative power as well. In each case, 
the characteristics of governance and national coordination are going to vary. And it's natural that it happens this way because these countries have different political and territorial organizations and different characteristics for their politics and organization. Regardless of the differences in the characteristics and structures of the national governance that is being proposed, the advantages of building strategies of this kind is the favoring of the follow-up on the re response strategies for us to be able to promote a balance between centralization and decentralization of the strategies for us to strengthen the political and institutional capacities in different instances of the government and to promote mechanisms of diplomacy and intergovernmental cooperation. We believe that we have a lot to learn about governance and national coordination from the Asian countries. The fourth aspect that we have as a lesson learned is the identification of some aspects that might be relevant singularities in the again the fight against COVID-19. We have the structure of the health system, the availability of healthcare workers, the national system of science and technology, and the capacity to produce inputs. And we also highlight the importance of public investment in those areas in short, mid, medium, and long term. And we would like to highlight also the capacity, the industrial and productive capacity of these two countries, both in Korea and in China. We have, we need to have a robust science system, science and technology system to favor the organization of this governmental response. And the last aspect that I would like to bring to our debate has to do with the humanitarian and economic consequences, which are extensive. The consequences tend to exacerbate the inequality. So the national responses are paramount, but we have to have global cooperations, as we all know. The coordination between the WHO, the national sanitary uh, institutions, professionals, and researchers from all countries, they favor the creation of new technologies for us to reduce the social and economic impacts. This is an extremely important debate where we highlight the role of China and South Korea, both globally and regionally. Having mentioned these remarks and these arguments and the invitation to debate, I would like to bring a few questions. If you can, of course, I would like to know, in your opinion, which are the strengths for the national response against COVID-19 in China and in South Korea? Do you identify weaknesses in this response and which would be the weaknesses? Another question is, in your opinion, what is the role of governance and national coordination in the governmental response of each case, which would be the main characteristics of, of those, that governance? The third question would be related to the aspects that favored the national response in each case. Would you highlight, for example, the previous structure of the healthcare system or the sanitary surveillance to fight against the sanitary emergency, would you highlight the production of inputs and equipment as a singularity for the response capacity in China and Korea? And regarding the aspects related to the system of public health, I would like to bring another question. In your opinion, which were the aspects or factors that were most important for the early detection and the follow-up on cases and contacts? When we think about the biggest challenges related to information on health, 
like artificial intelligence, digital health. What is your evaluation on the use of technologies in sanitary surveillance? Lastly, we have some questions that are connected to issues related um, to the communication with the society. What will be the possibilities to advance in the sense? What is the role of China and South Korea, in your opinion, in the construction of initiatives of multilateral cooperation? And in your final considerations, if you wish to do so, you can comment about, in your opinion, what which were the biggest lessons learned during the struggle against COVID-19 until this month of December. Once again, thank you very, very much for the participation and for the brilliant presentations. Thank you, Dr. Adelin, for the brilliant comments and for bringing many questions, very relevant questions to the debate. We also have some questions from the chat. Some questions were already asked by Dr. Adeline. I'm going to ask some more questions and then I'll pass the floor to Professor O and Professor Lobato. Adding to one of the questions that Dr. Adeline asked, Andre mentioned the experiences in previous epidemics like H1N1, SARS and MERS. How do you think the responses to those epidemics influenced this pandemic? Some participants in YouTube asked some questions about vaccination, which is one of the challenges that we're going to have to deal with in the next few months. How is the process of development and preparation for the vaccination of the population in the, those countries in China and Korea? What vaccines are being considered for immunization? Andre Lobato already mentioned that in his presentation, but we have also many uh, vaccines developed by other countries. And we see some countries making agreements with different companies. Which are the possibilities and the limits that those experiences may bring to the developing countries? And could you give your opinion on the waiver for technology patents for COVID-19, which is being discussed by the International Trade Organization proposed by South Africa and now supported by 109 countries? I will pass the floor first to Professor O and then to Professor Lobato. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for your uh, the brilliant comment and also very comprehensive uh, comment in my presentation, uh, Professor Adlin and also uh, Andrea uh, for your uh, sharing of your China experience uh, in more uh, the details. And also uh, it is very, really, uh, a great pleasure to have uh, the questions, uh, more, the tons of questions, <laughs> more than tens. Uh, but let me try to answer uh, one by one if I can. Uh, the uh, much more uh, the governance issues, probably uh, the more peaceful and persuasive, uh, very patient uh, governing. Uh, structures, which was uh, in the early phases of South Korea, in the, the early uh, half year of this year, we, we showed uh, our Korean government did a lot of very good job uh, for everyday uh, conference uh, and also very persuasive and very transparent. All the uh, information which was uh, achieved by government was shared daily basis. The no uh, concealing of no no hidden uh, information, 
even uh, every sad story or failure story was shared every day. So that was a very big asset of trust basis, trust buildings between the uh, general public and government. Uh, however, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned in, in, in a small amount of my presentation, after winning of general election, which was done in the, uh, the, the late April, the ruling party became much a bigger party uh, after uh, winning of the general election. So Congress uh, uh, occupied by the ruling party much bigger than before. Then debating uh, time was shortened. So that, that, was, that looks very nice at the beginning. Uh, however, the, in terms of uh, rapid uh, the implementation, however, over time, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily give us a very good result. So it, it prohibited with some sense a reasonable disagreement concerning so that too quick this, the decision is not necessarily good. And also in some sense, uh, the Korean politicians are, especially from the, uh, the famous politician uh, from the ruling parties are uh, in my perspective, they are uh, importing very uh, populist approaches from the Western Europe. And then, then populist approaching is very interesting. That is very much a rapid response to, uh, to uh, indicate somebody who are not doing well very quickly. Then uh, the public is supporting that decision. So uh, it, in some sense of blaming the, uh, the victim or blaming the uh, bad behaviors. We don't know the behavior, uh, bad behavior is not really uh, the, uh, so it is intermingled. Victim is victimized not only by their, their bad behavior, circumstances the environment may then be victimized. However, once they got infected or once they are involved in the cluster, they are uh, stigmatized and then ostracized, then, uh, the important, uh, very popular politicians are uh, indicating that groups as a uh, bad behavior and then uh, criticizing and also some punishment such as shutdown for the for some period of the business. Then people's, uh, uh, some the opponent, the, the supporters are very much in uh, the, the, the praising his actions, however, that does not necessarily, that in, increased popularity does not necessarily translate in, into decreased transmission rate. Probably the other part of population might be very much uh, uh, oppressed or uh, stigmatized and also uh, they became uh, uh, future protesters. They are not adhering to the political protocols, even they deny that. And some of them might be the victim uh, in some uh, socioeconomic aspect by the closure uh, or the, the reduced economic uh, activities because of the, uh, the COVID responses. Then uh, if society doesn't cover that, uh, doesn't compensate their uh, loss, economic loss very well, but they are uh, stigmatized, then they have no way to go very well. So they became protesters. So ruling parties are facing uh, protesters, which are uh, different uh, the values, but also a uh, little bit socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged groups so that they are potentially, they can unite it, theoretically. So that then made a very difficult situation in, in South Korea that was done in the uh, uh, August so that that politically polarized situation might be a, the different situation from the uh, all the successful responses. Then maybe we don't know the the true causal chain yet. However, this uh, December uh, third surging might be legacy of that August outbreak, based on that uh, lowered uh, the public uh, adherence, public adherence, so that. That was my, uh, my personal interpretation. So rather than going to the populist approach, that looks very uh, uh, clear at the uh, initial phases. However, that's not really good for the sustainable perspective. 
So the more persuasive and more patient uh, that reasonable dis uh, the respecting the reason of disagreement that can be uh, the better way to go in in my uh, advice for your governance structures in Brazil probably uh, that can be one of the reasons. Then the other one is uh, the science and then uh, the health supplies then industries and the academia's collaboration and between the government and then academias all the different actors collaboration that was done uh, quite well in the beginning especially for the public uh, uh, agencies such as korea cdc's collaborating with their uh, private industry to produce the test kit rt pcl so that public and private uh, the partnership was done very quickly and very effectively so that uh, Korean FDA approved their uh, invented RT-PCL uh, very early, very within a short period of time, maybe within two weeks. Then newly approved uh, the diagnostic test became uh, standardized and then scaled up for the across the countries. So many uh, centers can have the test, test of capacity. And then recently that was internationally uh, standardized by ISO. So that that uh, quick standardization approval processes, so standardization and the scale up for uh, different uh, the geographical area within country, that was uh, quickly done. So the some technique test center is public center, some test center is a private center. So not only for developing a kit, but also testing itself for everyday testing that can be also shared with the private and public together. So that is one good uh, example of the good collaboration. And also academia collaboration was done uh, very well in the early phases, much more uh, strength of the government is uh, immediate action rather than scholars action. Maybe academia's privilege is uh, uh, probably not immediate action and responsibility itself. So academic people are uh, much more relaxable than uh, the government officers. So that those differences might be a so for the first time, uh, the collaboration was not uh, huge. However, over time, government uh, became little fatigued and also they want to share, uh, uh, they want to fill the gap in terms of uh, good action and then good knowledge. Uh, the, the filling the gap needs some uh, additional uh, human resources support. That should be inevitably from academia. But still, I, I'm thinking uh, academia is not, uh, very much acquainted with the immediate action still, so that academia is much more slow and or more comprehensive and more long-term perspective action is much more comfortable with us. So that adjusting that uh, may be going over time. So recently uh, the more collaboration was going on very well, but on, on the early time, the academia tried to uh, do that collaboration, however, effectiveness of that in terms of real filling of the gap might be not huge in the early phases, but in the later phases, maybe it's going up and going up. So academia's role is becoming higher than before in, in my perspective, and that goes, uh, hopefully that goes well uh, over time. Then the other one is uh, the, the much more uh, early detection might be in, needed by some AI or some, some technical devices such as the virus detector or et cetera, not only for the, uh, the human respiratory, uh, the expiration based uh, things, the, not only the nostril, uh, the diagnosis test in the mouth and nose, but also if we can detect uh, virus by the respiratory uh, the air, then it might be much better, but we don't have it yet. But hopefully in some technical devices can detect that virus outside the body, not inside the body. Then we can uh, check the virus density in the uh, room, room uh, air. So, so that maybe we can have personal devices to detect the virus density. So that that may signal red color, yellow color, the, or green color, something then we might much more, uh, we might have much higher mobility, but we don't have that technology yet. However, uh, if we can uh, uh, expect the much more earlier, 
So how to quarantine earlier, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, today earlier than uh, symptomatic onset is current standard. However, if we extend that one or two day more, three or four days in advance, and then shortening the uh, tail, uh, we saw now more than five days, there is no more infectivity mostly, even though symptom is still going on, but infectivity is uh, completely or the, almost zero. So that cut down, cutting down the tail from the 14 days or after finishing the admission, discharging and the first 10 days or seven days, no, we just uh, uh, isolating only for uh, the six days or one week after on the symptom onset, then we don't need any negative pressure loom and then we don't need any specialized admission structures uh, after having one week of the symptom onset while we are giving uh, treatment. So by that way, uh, we can shift our uh, isolation period uh, into early times by applying some AI of the, uh, the contact tracing. AI may uh, support some uh, way of uh, contact risk uh, projection by keeping record and, and et cetera. So that, that, that might be also helpful. Then my uh, personal uh, learning might be, uh, let me say that, Currently, uh, so far, health system researchers and health police researchers as a one group, and the other group is a, might be the infectious disease specialist group. Those two, two groups are, are not really uh, collaborating to each other in the past. They are having their own silo. So the infectious disease cannot communicate with the health system researchers effectively with the same language and vice versa. But, uh, during this pandemic, I think uh, one, of, one of my personal challenges uh, was we may need this sort of much more united uh, language-based uh, approaching in terms of research so that maybe future uh, discipline can be uh, appearing by during uh, this pandemic. That is uh, a new discipline which uh, expertizing both aspects, health system, police and also infectious disease together. So who can be done? Uh, not only by one or two person, maybe it's really the good number of people uh, like you and uh, all uh, over the world, maybe we need a uh, new discipline. We probably, we, we need to develop that discipline together during this pandemic to prepare next pandemic by the another viruses, another type of transmission mode that doesn't necessarily ask us to do the same things for the uh, same pandemic. Uh, the different pandemic may need very different uh, the responses so that that can be uh, innovatively uh, invented by this new discipline. Otherwise we might be uh, experiencing. So let me pause here, even though I didn't reply all the uh, questions. Uh, you didn't reply all the questions, but I believe it's impossible to reply all the questions and you have uh, uh, the ones you answered, you answered very well, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, regarding some of the issues that were raised, uh, regarding the waiver of patents uh, made by Luana and the uh, global, co global multilateral cooperation. Uh, I will speak about this and also regarding local issues. So, for example, Professor was talking about mobility tracking in South Korea. Uh, we have a lot of mobility tracking uh, technologies. We are all tracked all the time with our cell phones, with our internet connections. Uh, so it's more about uh, how countries feel uh, about doing this monitoring. And if they have the access to the technologies, for example, uh, in China, they are using Alibaba. Uh, they are using the, the payment uh, devices, the payment apps. So you are doing the track with the payments app. Uh, they know where you are. And if you move around, your color changes. So for example, I'm here in Tijuca right now, Rio de Janeiro. Let's suppose I'm in a green area 
and then I go to visit someone in a red area in the city, uh, my, my, my color will change. Uh, I'm in a red area here uh, in Rio de Janeiro. And no, let's say I'm in a general red area, the city of Rio de Janeiro, and then I go to another city. I can be another color there because to that place, I'm a, I'm a bigger danger, uh, something like that. So this technology is available. Everybody that uses Google, Facebook, uh, we could all have that, uh, let's say this way, but it's a matter of programming and also a matter of law. And different countries will uh, in, in understand communication, tracking, uh, social responsibility in different ways. I think it's totally understandable that people don't want to be tracked there are people who don't want to be vaccinated. This is a really big, uh, big, big, big issue for us of uh, science areas because this translation is not easy. If people don't have connection with technology, if they don't use it in school, it's very difficult to them to believe in something that they have never seen actually uh, working. So uh, this is some experience. I think that Asia in general, uh, they are more inclined to be open, let's say, their data. Uh, it's something that Western societies are, have a lot of trouble to do because it's a violation of the individual. So this is an issue of uh, a, a complex issue. Regarding corporal, global cooperation, actually we had a backdrop in global cooperation. I think that if you get uh, HWO scientists and personnel and go back 15 years in time and say that with no, no major war, no major conflict, uh, humanity with uh, presidents and, and leader of states and, and societies, they would struggle so much for something that they believed was going to happen and they were preparing uh, this to happen. So many societies are torn not because of the virus, they were already in big trouble before. And it was very difficult to some very in-depth tech societies to stop working because everybody has a, a debt to pay. And so this was very difficult to, to, to translate to the population about the costs, the costs of stopping and not stopping. Uh, this is a numerical understanding of the value of life. But anyway, everybody has to do it. Every uh, major decision making in, has to take this in account. So I believe that we should uh, inf scientists, it's our role. We are the ones that can do it. Uh, even though the, I think that journalism is playing very badly the card of like the game, the confrontation, and everything is placed things like as nations were like pieces on a chessboard. It's a way of understanding national arena, but not necessarily the best way to fight an epidemic. And regarding the waiver of patents, I think it's a very important issue, but also touches with how the economies uh, uh, work. So for example, we have the recent economic partnership in Asia right now. And one of the issues was that two political issues, of course, but also was the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, India has not uh, uh, catch up with uh, North Korea and, and China, North Korea, no, South Korea, China, and Japan. And so they would have a lot of leverage to to protect their pharmaceutical companies. And they are the producers of, uh, the, they, pr they have a lot of, let's say, low level pharmaceuticals and they go to Europe many times to, or the United States and they, they are better working there. Uh, they become more valuable. And so this was a big problem to India. So it's totally understandable that countries such as South Africa and India and Brazil, Brazil didn't do it, but Brazil usually like historically speaking takes spots on this uh, is to try to have access to the patents because the patents they work in a comp compounds you have an app an, an, uh, and a patent that works with another patent so you never get a, a patent like a, a strand a small strand of rna and then you put in your system and then everything starts to work 
So how, what vaccine is going to be, for example, creates a very big scale on what kind of technologies you will use and what is going to be the final cost uh, of them. So in this regard, uh, I believe that some sort of waiver should be, should be discussed. Uh, the China has been saying that it's going to be make its vaccine a public good. This creates a lot of problems and a lot of disputes because there has been billions and billions and billions invested in new technology that uh, were never used, but they are very promising. So what do you do with this uh, technological trajectory uh, of vaccines? Because you have like more in vitro vaccines uh, that has been in use for a long time. And should we use that? Should we use another one? Uh, national uh, councillors of health, uh, local councillors of health in Brazil recently said Brazil should buy every all vaccines. Since we, we are in this problem, we buy all vaccines. There are other countries that they want to do uh, one national uh, buying. And there are, uh, you know, depending on the, the country, you have a federal system, uh, you have an uncentralized system. Also, you have countries with a population that is very, very, very small and others with a population very big. We know that epidemically speaking, it's very different to have five people and to have 5,000 people, especially because of the rate of the transmission of the virus. Uh, so I don't think we will have like a, a, a new lockdown on many governments. I don't think the societies, they show that they are going to do it. Uh, the leaderships that uh, try to do it, they don't have the necessary support to do it because you need more than 50% of the votes, you understand, to do a lockdown. You don't do a lockdown with 50%. You don't do a lockdown with 70%. You need 90% to do a proper uh, lockdown and quarantine. And how this will translate in the, how societies do their political uh, organization, uh, parliaments, uh, ministers, uh, justice, we know that some, for example, countries, they, the, the, the leadership, the political leadership said, let's close everything. And then the, the judicial system uh, said, no, no, you cannot close that because society is reacting. Society also reacts against the quarantine. We cannot uh, possible think that if in a new epidemic, if we all survive this one, we hope we do it, uh, that people will, okay, they will receive an email, oh, now your life is going to change, all your plans are going to be erased, everything is going to become a mess. So it's a very difficult, it's a big change of expect expectings, uh, expectations. So I think this should be handled uh, as well. And so the early detection, I think this is very important to see, to speak. Uh, I, I think that China has been uh, pressured a lot about its earlier response. I think we all always should pressure earlier response. The per person resp responsible for the earlier response, uh, she should always be a pressured. But if you pressure too much, nobody will ever uh, uh, release information again. And this is a trade-off. This is a very uh, difficult trade-off. And this happened in China, and they punished the, the, the local system that tried to, let's say, uncover the situation. We know that in many countries, there are people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people uh, are dead. And their governments are still saying that this is not a big problem. So it's a very difficult, different ways of uh, societies are handling the same piece of information that is this, uh, this, this, this virus. So I think that uh, we, are, we now know that such as in climate, environment, uh, health is really global. It's not like an uh, academic talk, slow talk. Uh, this happened, unfortunately, it was predicted. And I'm really curious about uh, South Korea strategies for mobility, uh, because I know that you are more advanced regarding that. I know that you have some uh, native uh, apps that are very used in South Korea that are not used nor in China, neither in Brazil or United States. So I believe this could be a good uh, field of cooperation uh, since that, as it seems, 
mobility will continue uh, regarding or not uh, the damage that it's uh, doing. Uh, yeah, uh, the regarding these three questions remaining, uh, I, I think every every question is very, very uh, crucial, not easy. However, if you are uh, willing to listen to my opinion, uh, let me respond one by one. Then uh, regarding the patent issues, uh, we, we may need to praise the the private industry, which are frontiering of the uh, new vaccines and new pharmaceuticals based on their investment. Although uh, not 100% of investment is coming from their own uh, investment, some of them are coming from public uh, investment together or public support or governmental support, specimen or any et cetera from the patient or an et cetera. So that uh, I don't say uh, everything is uh, coming from the private industry. However, uh, we cannot deny the private industry's commitment is huge, and then that is very important. So how to guarantee their profit, uh, not to lose their uh, economic uh, position or uh, situation? Uh, although uh, some of the uh, industry already mentioned that they don't seek uh, profit in this COVID business, uh, so that we can uh, acknowledge that services by some other way. So maybe one of the way is UK way in the general pharmaceutical industry to guaranteeing the certain range of profit so that afterward we can cut over a profit or we can support under profit. So that making that uh, reasonable range of profit as UK government did for the uh, maintaining profit of the pharmaceutical industry, that can be uh, our international lesson, we can be applied for the global level so that we can use multilateral grant uh, uh, as a uh, profit uh, guaranteeing grant in some portion. So that that can be one of the uh, way. And also multilateral uh, action can be technically, uh, it can be steering the much more uh, the, uh, the research and also that can be a technical support, uh, uh, not only technical support and then project and program-based uh, approaching, but we may uh, shift from the project program-based approaching toward uh, the budget support approaching so that monetary transaction uh, can be much more, in should be much more encouraged than before so that uh, unless technical support is uh, crucially uh, then more than monetary support uh, can be first prioritized. So for, for example, South Korean government can uh, provide much more budget support to, to other low middle income countries compared to previous times. So increasing budget support to leisure than uh, program or project-based approaching or, or more smaller, narrow, or singular approachings. That might be one thing. And the other one is uh, much more science collaboration uh, can be encouraged by uh, the multilateral uh, grant support. So that I, I see more than 20 uh, global voluntary research groups, if they can be supported by much more uh, uh, grant and also some uh, timeline uh, request, then it might be much more helpful than other predetermined uh, uh, grant activities, uh, which was uh, continued from the past. So that that might be one thing we can uh, uh, apply. And the other one is uh, the how to utilize the mobility uh, traction uh, technology. So there might be three ways utilizing that uh, tracking of the, the position can be applied for prospective way or retrospective way or cross-sectional way. So as Andrea already mentioned, uh, the cross-sectional way, if I uh, entering a certain place, that uh, maybe that the traction tracking uh, the device can allow me, this is a highly, highly probable to be infected area. That is one of the way of cross-sectional information. Then the other one is uh, uh, the prospective way. 
uh, if you are here, you will be infected much more than uh, coming to other areas. So that, that's a little different uh, interpretation. But one retrospective way is you are uh, informed. Once someone is uh, diagnosed, then you are automatically uh, informed. You contacted one newly diagnosed person today. Uh, you contacted him or her two days ago, where and when. So this is a retrospective way of uh, the tracking. Within these three, uh, I think uh, accuracy might be much more higher in the retrospective way. Uh, if we voluntarily uh, access or downloaded that application, then the Bluetooth-based or NH tra or GPS-based, then actually the person who downloaded that can be benefited by that, that way. Once someone is infected and diagnosed, then he or she is also downloaded that application then within that uh, application users community, they can be helping each other to inform uh, accuracy base. However, uh, if that uh, user's population is too small, then might be not a huge population impact, but if it goes up to 30%, 40%, 50%, it can be almost vaccine so that they can be very accurate uh, information transmission or can can be done so that that will be making quarantine much more effective than before. But uh, in the real time cross-sectional way of information sharing by the tracking system, I think uh, basis of the probability of infected when, when I get enter this uh, building at this space, that might be much overestimated or also underestimated so that how can we estimate the uh, probability of the infection uh, in uh, the real-time basis by what information? Probably one of the information basis might be infected people's density in that area. However, that does not necessarily mean the real infection uh, possibility because of the different uh, barriers or different isolation status or different uh, treatment, uh, the date, uh, beginning date of the treatment so that Infection does not infection density does not necessarily predict the probability of get infected. So that infected people density would be one of the easy information. However, that might be first information uh, to get over protection or under protection, maybe over protection. So that uh, I I might be a little bit uh, cautious about uh, encouraging the real time cross sectional in data information based approaching, and also future prospective approaching might be much more riskier. We cannot uh, estimate quite with a high accuracy uh, of the uh, prospective way, so that how can we say that uh, is much more uh, difficult than uh, real time cross sectional information sharing, so that in that sense. I might be encouraging to utilize a retrospective way of uh, tracking, position tracking information. That is also co well coupled with uh, uh, public health measures such as isolation and then uh, quarantine. Otherwise, much more prospective or real-time cross-sectional information sharing might bring, bring us toward much more individual responsibility or general public behavioral response approaching only. Uh, with the ignoring of the public health responses such as isolation and quarantine. We need both societal action for quarantine and isolation because that is highly high risk or high probability of uh, making infection to others. Infected people already without isolation, they infect other people much higher uh, probability than general public probability is contacting each other. And also quarantine is also next uh, level of high probability unless uh, quarantine was done. So that compared to general public's, uh, the contact frequencies and contact tracking, it's much higher uh, in terms of efficiency of their, uh, their isolation of the, uh, the groups. So that focusing more on isolation and focusing more on quarantine should be uh, kept so that uh, to keep that aspect but uh, if we can apply uh, the position tracking system for general public, maybe if we can apply that retrospective way, that can be complementary. But if we try to apply that into more prospective way or real-time basis, 
maybe that give us a false information or false expectation to ignore public health measures, quarantine and isolation. Maybe people doesn't follow really a order of the isolation of the quarantine. That's temporary uh, the lockdown, temporary isolation, temporary segregation. However, uh, once this uh, el elusive uh, information about the tracking systems uh, uh, benefit, if it is uh, too much increased, I think public health measure will be uh, disrupted. So that in that sense, I might be encouraging uh, utilize retrospective way, but still uh, that need little privacy issues and acceptance of issues. But uh, if that can be accepted by public, uh, by their own voluntary uh, downloading of the ap application and is incrementally increasing, that can be very similar to vaccination herd immunity aspect. Let me pause it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, obrigada, professor. Oh, and... Thank you, Professor O oh, and Professor Lobato for the comments. Actually, we are over our time. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. We have many other questions from the chat. I would like to apologize for not having time to answer all of the questions from the chat, but I would like to thank the participants, Professor O, Professor Lobato, Dr. Adelini for the excellent debate and brilliant presentations. I'm sure that uh, they're going to be very useful for our research project and they will serve as some lessons learned to our country. I would like to thank also the participants who are watching us on YouTube Vitu Saúde team who is supporting us with the broadcast, the sign language translators and the Portuguese English interpreters, VPAC team with the logistics and the COVID-19 observatory that supported us and made it possible for this event to happen and the colleagues from the research group that are supporting us in the selection of the questions on the chat. I would like to thank you all and um, pass the floor to Professor Cristiane Machado for her final comments. Thank you very much. I think this was really wonderful. Thank you for your very comprehensive and uh, broad presentations. I uh, learned a lot for sure. Thank you, Professor Johan, for your availability. I, we know that it's quite late in Seoul at this moment, so thank you for joining us. Thank you, Andrea, as well, for your participation. Uh, Adeline, Luana, for organizing this and all our team. I think we've learned a lot and there are uh, this webinar will be also very useful for our students and for the researchers who are not able to attend at this moment. There are lots of things to learn from Korea and from China and the Chinese experience as well. As well, this um, I mentioned there was very emphasized by both of you that we are facing a global problem. And so uh, to answer better to that, we have to actually in partnership and also uh, how the national responses have to be more coordinated. And uh, we have this some st structural problems that affect the response. We have as well political, uh, a political dimension, uh, especially regarding governance and coordination that's very, very important as well. So thank you so much for joining us today and we have a lot of material to to think about and to uh, analyze. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And we'll keep in touch, okay? Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for all the participants that have been with us. Thank you.